Which ear does the nystagmus and vestibular neuritis beat towards? Hi people, Peter Johns here, emergency physician practicing in Ottawa, Canada. The answer to this question isn't obvious, and it has a bit of an interesting pathophysiology as well as some clinical implications when you're trying to rule out a stroke in a patient with vertigo and nystagmus. Here is a loop of the nystagmus in a patient with vestibular neuritis. It's mainly horizontal beating to the left, his left. Remember that the direction of the nystagmus is defined by the fast component, not the slow. It's not well seen here, but there's often a torsional component seen in vestibular neuritis in the same direction as the horizontal nystagmus. Here's an example of a fair bit of torsional component as well as horizontal nystagmus to the right. You can see the torsional component by looking at the small red vessels on his eyes. When I ask my learners, what does the nystagmus in vestibular neuritis look like? They usually say that the nystagmus is horizontal, which, as we saw, is correct. It's horizontal with a variable amount of torsional component. Then I ask, which ear does it beat towards? The good ear or the affected ear? This is where they often get a deer in the headlights look. Then they often guess that the nystagmus beats towards the affected ear, probably because in posterior canal BPPV, a positive Dix-Hoff-like test demonstrates vertical upward and torsional nystagmus towards the affected ear, which is the downward ear, as seen in this patient who is right ear posterior canal BPPV. In BPPV, you have an ear rock problem, which produces nystagmus with certain head movements. In vestibular neuritis, it's thought that a virus is causing inflammation of the vestibular nerve on one side, impairing the signals getting to the brain. And in fact, in vestibular neuritis, the nystagmus beats away from the affected ear, or you could say towards a good ear. Why is that? Does it even matter? Well, yes, there are clinical implications related to the head impulse test, which is part of the HINTS exam, which is how you diagnose vestibular neuritis. In vestibular neuritis, the patient has constant vertigo for many hours or days, nausea, vomiting, difficulty walking, and they have spontaneous nystagmus or gaze evoked nystagmus at least in the first day or so. And they shouldn't have any central features such as new significant headache or neck pain, focal paresthesias or weakness, or the, any of the dangerous Ds, diplopia, dysarthria, dysmetria, dysphonia, or dysphagia, or inability to walk unaided. So in this patient with vestibular neuritis and small amplitude horizontal nystagmus beating to his left, his affected ear is his right ear. And in this patient with nystagmus beating to the right, his affected ear is his left ear. To understand why this is, you need to know some anatomy and physiology. In this image of the inside of the base of the skull, just anterior to the blue thing, which is the sigmoid sinus, is the yellow vestibular cochlear nerve. And it disappears into the petrous ridge of the temporal bone, where you can see the labyrinth, which is partially pacified in this image. In the labyrinth are the end organs of balance, which include your semicircular canals. This diagram shows the general orientation of both left and right labyrinth, which are obviously not shown in actual size. The internal diameter of the semicircular canals is only about a fifth of a millimeter. The disc-like areas shown in each semicircular canal are the ampulla, in which there's a gelatinous mass called the cupola, which is shown here as a brown flame-shaped thingy. And within the cupola are the hair cells that send signals back to the brain. The hair cells have a resting firing rate of many times a second in the hundreds. In order to see well, you need to be able to fixate your eyes on something, even when you're moving. The kestrel, who can only move their eyes one degree, uses their vestibular system to ensure that their head stays perfectly still so they can see extremely well. But we can move our eyes quite a bit more than the kestrel, and we use the hair cells in the semicircular canals to sense when we're rotating our head and then move our eyes automatically to stay on target so that we can see things clearly even when moving around quite a bit. It's your brain's image stabilization software, if you will. This is the neural pathway necessary to have an intact vestibulo-ocular reflex, or VOR. You can see the vestibular nerve is in yellow at the bottom right. You don't need to know all the other elements of this pathway, but it's worth noting that the VOR doesn't involve the cerebellum, which is why in cerebellar strokes, the head impulse test is generally normal. This is the counterintuitive thing about the head impulse test. A normal head impulse test is concerning for a cerebellar stroke, but in vestibular neuritis, you get an abnormal head impulse test, and that's reassuring that they probably don't have a stroke. So when your head is still, both left and right ears and organs of balance fire at about the same rate. If my head is turned to the right, then the right ear starts firing faster and the left slower. Something like this. Also, you'll notice that my eyes will stay on the target. That's the vestibular ocular reflex sensing that my 
head is turned to the right, starts drifting my eyes to the left so that I'll stay on target. Now, if instead of both firing at the same rate at rest, the left one is now not firing or firing much less because of vestibular neuritis, then my brain will interpret that as my head is always turning to the right, so my eyes will always start to drift off the target. But my brain will sense it's drifting off the target and rapidly remove it, remove it to the middle, which will be the rapid, the rapid part of the nystagmus. That's why the slow phase of the nystagmus and vestibular neuritis is towards the affected ear and the rapid phase is towards the good ear. So what is the clinical implication of knowing which is the affected ear? Because if a patient has suspected vestibular neuritis with constant vertigo for hours or days, nausea, vomiting, difficulty walking, and horizontal torsional nystagmus, and they screen negative for central features as I discussed earlier, and if you apply the other aspects of the HINTS exam to them so that the nystagmus doesn't change direction and there's no vertical skew deviation and no new hearing loss, which is the plus part of HINTS plus, then you can perform the head impulse test. And the head impulse test should be abnormal on one side and normal on the other side, as in this gentleman with vestibular neuritis. While this woman, who's having a cerebellar stroke, has a normal head impulse test on both sides because the vestibular ocular reflex doesn't involve the cerebellum and there's nothing wrong with her vestibular nerve. Now, going back to the first band we saw with nystagmus beating towards the left, so which ear is the affected ear? The right ear. And when you move his head rapidly towards the affected right side, the VOR is overwhelmed by the rapid movement, he can't stay on the target, so you get a catch up to CAD, while the other side is normal. With our second patient, the nystagmus is beating towards the right ear. So the affected ear? Yup, the left ear. And when do we see the abnormal head impulse test? When the head is turned rapidly to the left. Ta-da! And again, if you didn't see it the first time. Now, is it important to know which ear has the abnormal head impulse test? I think of it as a little safety check, because if you think you're seeing the catch of the CAD when you turn the head rapidly in the direction of the nystagmus, that's not consistent with vestibular neuritis, and you'd better step back a bit and ensure that you're seeing what you think you're seeing. So in summary, how do you make the diagnosis of vestibular neuritis? Well, of course, they have to have the acute vestibular syndrome, as described here. They have to screen negative for the central features, as we already went over. And then all four components of the HINTS Plus exam have to have a peripheral result. And the last piece of that puzzle is seeing an abnormal head impulse test when the head is turned rapidly towards the affected ear. And when you see that, their overall HINTS Plus is peripheral, and they almost always are going to have vestibular neuritis. Well, there you have it. A little anatomy and pathophysiology, and some clinical relevance to boot. If you want to learn more on how to perform the head impulse test, watch this video. It'll show you some useful tips that'll help you hone your skills on this bedside test. Thanks for watching.